right, and welcome back. Uh, this is Hannah again and Daniela. Um, and today we'll be talking about legacies and horizons um, and a lesson focusing on queer joy and queer g- uh, grief. Sorry. Um, just looking at our history as like the history of the LGBT community, um, particularly focusing on the HIV AIDS crisis and the legacy from that. But to start, we're going to start on a little lighter note about how we can celebrate ourselves and feel ourselves, featuring a sort of Saint Sylvester and Sophie. Um, and just a little warm up uh, reminder on group norms. Yes, so some group norms, especially to consider in this lesson, giving people space when it's needed. Um, We're doing, again, some heavy topics, so this is important to keep in mind. And then active listening, just like engaging and respecting what other people are saying right now is really important. Yeah, Um, and we encourage you, like if you want to speak about this with anybody, around you, any of your friends and such. Uh, Just remember it is, it can be rather heavy. The uh, HIV AIDS uh, epidemic is no joke um, and can bring up a lot of really hard feelings for people. So just being uh, conscious of that. Yeah, so some of the questions that we have for you today is like, what are you wearing today? Look at yourself up and down. Do you feel good in what you're wearing? What is, what gives you gender euphoria? That feeling of like, feeling so good and like sexy in what you're wearing. Um, and then think about a moment of this week where you felt so joyous and like good and confident. You know, and it's just something to keep in the back of your mind as we um, start this lesson. Yeah, because uh, I didn't want it to be completely down and heavy this week because it I truly, with this lesson today, I want to remind you that we, we can't always feel grief truly by itself or joy truly by itself. We're, we're complex and such and like we can still feel good in our bodies while recognizing some hard history. Yeah. So we'll be... Uh, talking about three artists today uh, to start off with. Um, and we'll start with a sort of saint who was a poet, a director, a performer, um, a part of an electronic duo with his partner, just truly an awesome uh, artist. He was uh, born in Lakai in Haiti in 1957, and he moved to New York City when he was 13. Actually, he was living at home uh, with his grandmother, but his mom had been up in New York City for some time, and he went up to visit her when he was 13, and he fell in love with it, and he begged her and begged her, and finally she was like, okay, you can move up here. And then he was based in New York City until his uh, untimely death, in uh, June 29, 1994, when he was 36 years old. Um, But Asada Saint, he was a visionary and led the way in multiple creative avenues, especially for Black gay writers. He was based in New York City, who was a huge figure in the art scene uh, when he was around, uh, and truly like established some really influential and impactful institutions, including Galen's Press, which uh, is a, the name comes from a portmanteau between gay and aliens. Um, and he centered black gay writers in that publishing. He also created Metamorphosis Theater Company, which both had original productions and other plays again centering black gay writers because there was this gay art community in new york city but it was very white it was very uh, upper class and such and rather exclusive in other ways so creating that space that creative space is really critical and he he really did that he created with an urgency not only his own creative works but the spaces needed for other people to do like creative work. 
And then finally, he was also uh, created music in the duo Zatika with his partner. Um, and that, like, again, the room, making that room that was needed, um, that space that was needed, he, ref he referred back to his personal mantra, which was truth at all costs. And even when those truths get ugly and terrifying, at all costs, be honest, be true, and true to yourself, which I think is really powerful. Um, he was one of the first Black gay male activists to disclose his positive HIV status with the public uh, in a, uh, that particularly happened in a documentary that he was featured in. And so with that consciousness, because uh, he was diagnosed rather early on, there is that urgency because early on when uh, HIV started appearing in the States, there wasn't really, there wasn't any way to know how you could survive long term. So this is a poem that he wrote for another writer who was in the scene, the New York scene with him, who, whose name was Essex Hemphill. Um, this poem is about um, just a little small form of visibility and how he carried pride uh, in his day to day. So it says, every day, every time I leave my house, everywhere I go, I put on my knapsack, twin petal small flags to which my allegiance is pledged whole. These flags are not monkeys on my back. I carry them as a coat of arms, mantles of double, double brotherhood, they shield like second skin to drape my dreams. One floats rainbow, the other wings tricolor. Both bold with movement, I am not ashamed of what they stand for, whether their meaning is questioned. These flags are not chips on my shoulders. I carry them as beauty spots, markings of double brotherhood. They shine like mirror beads to reflect prejudice. One unfurls the future of the queer nation, the other salutes African ancestors. Both wave SOS signals. I am not afraid to stand my ground when their beauty is challenged. These flags are not crossbones on my life. I carry them as amulets, emblems of double brotherhood they spellbind like stars to stripe America. Glory that becomes me in tribal rituals and battle against bigots I have honored with my blood everywhere I go, every time I leave my house. And yeah, so that that poem was about the rainbow pride flag and the black power flag colors. Beautiful. So <laughs> Um, this is Sylvester. He is a gay disco icon that just ruled the scene in the disco fever stage of um, the 60s, 70s. Um, so he was born in Watts, California on September 6, 1947, and then he moved to San Francisco in 1969. So he, he lived at home with his family, um, grandmother, but at home, it wasn't like the safest place to be. Um, a lot of people questioned why like he dressed the way he did or why he expressed himself the way he did. Um, but Sylvester never felt the need to be identified or labeled into a box, you know? He, gender was an everyday choice for him. Um, and he lived in the gray area or the in-between. And that's his kind of legacy, you know? Um, for him, like finding a home was a part of being and loving himself. So home was him. Um, something that he used to say is, I'm Sylvester and I'm proud of who I am. And I think that's something that we can all embody, especially when we're out there facing new people or not even there it can be in here facing yourself um he was also a songwriter singer and he loved he loved to write about love and identity and he was always loud about that message that he wanted to convey um one of his most famous songs uh you make me feel mighty real is about 
just it's kind of like on the dance floor um seeing this person and realizing that within that um yes um so within that uh in within that space he felt even more real and more himself um and it's just beautiful to see um sylvester unfortunately died um due to the aids pandemic as well um and even though he wasn't uh out there he wasn't the first one to say like oh i have it um he was very much an advocate um to finding a solution to the issue and just um talk about gay rights and all of that stuff so very much important and an icon definitely yes Yes, his once you hear his stuff, you'll hear his, the influences all over. Um, we really suggest you check out the music video for this, uh, and we'll link that. We'll make sure to link that below. Mm -hmm. uh, also, with the musicians that we're featuring today, they're both gonna be. They're both uh, on the playlist that we made for the class that we were having. Um, which we highly suggest you check out if you're curious about any um, LGBT musicians, and including icons like Sil Sylvester. Yes. And so both Asado Saint and Sylvester were affected and contracted HIV themselves. And this is, the, is, this is not meant to be some kind of mark or stain on them uh, because there's a lot of uh, both then and now, there is stigmas against people who are HIV positive. Um, the way that it began in the United States, at first, wasn't spoken about much at all uh, because it was deemed like a gay illness. And first of all, you shouldn't, the, the norm was that you shouldn't acknowledge the existence of gay people, of trans people, of gender non-conforming people because that's just gonna egg them on, right? Like you should, they didn't want people like that to exist. Um, and this was including in institutionalized harm. Um, but it started in, around, in the late 1970s um, with like first kind of uh, reporting on it uh, from in the 1970s, but first properly like identified that this is something that needed to be a public health issue in 1981. Uh, it took uh, the current the president at that time, Reagan, uh, to first to, to actually first publicly recognize it in September 1985. Uh, and the, this response of just silence, uh, really harsh, cold silence was not the only way that government leaders responded to the existence of the uh, AIDS crisis. Uh, they, <laughs> the, the responses like really ranged a spectrum of harm from that like kind of apathy that Reagan was showing to uh, people like Jerry Falwell pronouncing everywhere loudly and proudly that it was the gay plague, which was a wrath of God to punish people for their sins. Uh, again, this is a terrible way to look at people, um, but some of that stigma still stick, sticks around today. And yeah, so it took like almost 10 years for the sitting president to actually recognize that it was an issue and it even took longer. And the issue with that is that if it's not being publicly recognized, then research funding isn't going to a, a treatment or even a cure to be, being found. And so there were people were dying and their pain and suffering wasn't being recognized. So groups like the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power or Act Up to Short were created. Um, and they were very powerful in getting the word out. They had very large demonstrations and such and came up with many slogans such as silence equals death. Because as the government and media were staying silent about this issue, or rather um, speaking it out about it in euphemistic terms or as if people deserved it, people were dying. That was directly contributing to people's deaths. Um, and, but coverage wasn't enough. Urgency and the funding of research needed to be advocated for and continuously so. That work continues to the current day. 
all the way from the 1970s. Um, but, the, but ACT UP were really critical in getting that movement started and going and consistent. Um, their dramatic demonstrations, um, the, an example is that they had a die-in in uh, Washington DC on the steps of the Capitol. Um, and they publicly shamed multiple leaders um, repeatedly to try and get some movement uh, on what was going on in the, in the gay community. Um, and yeah, that, that unyielding energy was really critical over time. Um, and so the height of the crisis was from the 70s into the 90s. Uh, and it was rather terrifying because it, this was before the internet, before a lot of people were carrying their phones with them, you know, like mobile phones and stuff. Um, so some, a lot of it was that there were people that they would just disappear. And you don't know if they moved or more likely that they may have died. Uh, and also because of the heavy shame that it was carried around, a lot of people, when they realized that they were HIV positive, kept that to themselves and either isolated themselves or just didn't say anything until they were stuck in the hospital. So it was very difficult, but there is hope. There was, there has been many moves forward. A lot of, there are different treatments. People, it's not a death sentence anymore uh, to be, to have contract that. There are medications like PrEP, which is like a, a kind of a proactive treatment to stop that contract like any contraction of that happening. Uh, and there's also this morning, actually, I learned that uh, clinical trials are being run for an RNA based uh, vaccine for HIV, which is actually being developed by one of the same uh, COVID vaccine creators, Moderna. Awesome. So One by One um, is a poem uh, that is performed by a sort of saint. Um, from and it's from Poets for Life, um, a book that has like different compilations, and then it has 76 poets that responded to the AIDS crisis. Saints writing on his a, writes on his like personal experience with AIDS, and both of that of him and his partner, and it is so heart wrenching to hear about. So one by one, it kind of describes the process of just like realizing that slowly one by one people were just disappearing like Hana mentioned before they are just like going places like because of the shame because of the lack of advocacy people were just one by one disappearing and then he questions like how many ones does it take for it to be thousands and then like just disappeared from the face of the earth. That's really difficult to hear and engage with. Um, and it like it's hard to engage just this art that explicitly talks about grief and the journey through the AIDS crisis um, because it's so tied to those people's emotions. But this art shouldn't um, be denied or turned away from because if anything, it's such a great learning experience and it can help you work through some shame and guilt and just uh stigma that you might have yourself um for this topic or for any other that um involves in your life and it's a part of our history um so it's important to keep that memory alive so that we learn from it and hopefully it never happens again <laughs> Yeah, this, this performance we will also link in the description below. I really suggest you uh, watch it and read some more of Asado Saint's uh, works because it it really, it cuts raw, um, but it also really connect to it um, and feel the emotion of that moment. Uh, this poster that, that I have on the slide, it, saying how many of us will be alive for Stonewall 35 was made by ACT UP in uh, 1969, circa. Um, and yeah, it's referring to the Stonewall riots, which 
happened in 1969. Uh, it really questions how many of us will be alive for that? Who's going to be around? Because it really just felt like one by one, everyone was going until one day there would be none. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've been able to uh, change that course um, and really help people and support that. But the work is not finished. Um, so there's just a couple of questions tied to that. It was just like, how do we hold space for grief and joy? Because during this time, it wasn't purely sorrow and sadness within the community. Uh, there was still, you know, moments of joy, beautiful art being made. Asado Saint himself, even if he knew that at some point this um, virus would be what kills him, he was still creating with all of his heart and such. Yeah. And like really beautiful art that came out of this, not only the heart wrenching, but really joyful too. So how do we hold space for that and be able to recognize that those things are true together, not separately. Yeah. And, and like, like yeah, go ahead. something else um, is um, to think about whether it's important to carry that loss with us as we move forward. You know, loss can be a terrible thing, but it isn't something that should weigh you down. If anything, it's important for, again, holding that space to appreciate what is it that you have lost. and take those lessons with you and take that um those memories with you and move forward with them because they're a part of you they're integral to us beautifully said um so finally with our last artist uh she is more contemporary but i think uh sophie is a figure that shows us both the really extremes of the joy and grief that we can hold as we are going forward. Um, she was born in Glasgow in 1986 um, and moved around. She was based in LA for some time. Uh, her Most of her music is like she was doing DJ sets and then started producing for a lot of artists, including like Charlie XCX and Ben Staples and a lot of people her her impact could not be understated um but unfortunately at the beginning of this year in 2021 um she was based briefly in athens um and but uh she unfortunately passed at on january 31st 2021 um but sophie she's just truly enigmatic and inspiring and really beautiful um most of the time referred to as sophie all caps mononymously but also you could refer to her as sophie zion and she was the first transgender artist to be nominated for a grammy which is really exciting um and she made really boundary pushing music with like these surreal pop tunes uh with all these influences she had just such a talent at pulling all these influences together uh, such as techno, house, R&B, and disco, like Sylvester. Um, really very experimental music. It's Yeah. Um, and so this is a one music video that we had highlighted of hers in the, in the live virtual lesson. Um, and I highly suggest that you check it out. It's called It's Okay to Cry. Um, yeah. Uh, you just definitely check it out after the Sylvester music video. Make yourself a nice cue. Uh, and again, uh, check out the, the playlist that we made. Uh, it highlights a lot of really cool artists, both people who um, have passed already, but also contemporary people who are still active and working. Yeah. And so that's all for us today. I hope you can take some time to, you know, breathe, process, take it in. I know this was a lot, but thank you so much for joining us for this lesson. Next class, uh, we're gonna uh, help you get up on your feet. It's gonna be a movement special on Ariel Edwards, uh, who's a very cool fully based artist. Well, that's it for today. See ya.